Hello, U.S. history students, and welcome to the start of sectionalism lecture. Um, this is going to be kind of a really big, broad lecture covering America from about 1800 to about 1850, so right before the nation splits and we're heading towards war. However, the theme of this lecture is how America grows economically, socially, and politically apart in this roughly 50-year period. So the first topic that we're going to talk about is political differences. And this essential question we are going to tackle is how the growth of political parties in the early 19th century led to the Civil War. So first, let's talk about these political parties. First, we'll tackle the Federalists. Move me over here. And Federalists believed in a loose construction of the Constitution, which essentially gives more power to the federal government. So when it comes to the Second Amendment, for example, the one that says the right to bear arms shall not be uh, infringed upon in order to have a well-regulated militia, Federalists would say, yeah, or in today's society, Federalists would say, yeah, but the framers never really mo uh, wanted people to have an RPG or a rocket propelled grenade or, yeah, the framers really didn't envision a nuclear weapon. So, no, we're not going to have a nuclear weapon, right? So that's kind of a loose or more elastic view of the Constitution. In addition to that, Federalists favored a strong central government, and this is really aligned with the previous point about this loose constitution. Uh, if you have a strong central government, the government might grow bigger, the government might have more responsibilities than the states, and this creates a different power structure than maybe these anti-Federalists or Democratic Republicans wanted. Um, with this strong um, central government, uh, like in today's society, we would have you know, the Secretary of Education, Secretary of Interior, you know, Secretary of Defense. Um, we have a very large federal government that's going to take care of a variety of aspects of everyday Americans' lives. In addition to that, Federalists favored trade and manufacturing. They specifically favored trade with England. Uh, in the Federalist mind, um, banking and having a solid financial structure with trade kept everyone safe because it kept countries obligated to each other in a business sense to make money, but also that would also keep everybody safe because if everybody is trying to make really good financial decisions um, on you know, their behalf, then they're not going to go to war, right? You're not going to go to war with somebody who owes you money because you want them to pay you back and have that money. In addition, Federalists like Alexander Hamilton really envisioned America turning into this uh, mega industrial and banking center. And this is quite different from the view of some Democratic Republicans. So when it comes to viewing the Constitution, these new Democratic Republicans will have a strict view on the Constitution. And one reason why they have a strict view on the Constitution is they want, um, they're fearful of the federal government abusing the power of the people or abusing the power of the states. And so they want to make sure that you have that Ninth and Tenth Amendment really followed through, which powers uh, not delegated to Congress or to the executive branch go to the states or go to the people. They don't, they don't want um, the federal government abusing their power like King George did. They also believe in strong state governments. So again, a return to that Ninth and Tenth Amendment with powers delegated to the states and powers delegated to the people. So if we take education, for example, today in 2020, a federalist might say we can have a secretary of education and the secretary of education will have a federal plan of education that states will then implement. The Democratic Republican would say, no, 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 we don't need a secretary of education having this top-down system of education. If Texas wants to have this view of education, then they will. If California does, then they'll implement their plan. And each individual state can then decide how to implement their education plan. Now, early Democratic Republicans, like Thomas Jefferson, really envisioned America as an agrarian society with a whole bunch of just small farmers conducting trade with each other. Now, in this view, you wouldn't need to have a massive banking system because everyone's really kind of these small subsistence farmers creating a sense of community and trading with each other. Now, in Thomas Jefferson's view, everyone would do the right thing. We have the spirit of 1776. We're all Republican-minded here, and we would all do right by each other. So we don't need this big brother government kind of bearing down 
um, on us. We don't need a secretary of treasury to handle our, de our debt. Uh, we'll have the states handle their debts and we'll have individual farmers kind of pay their dues um, as they agree to it in their individual state. So again, we have these different political parties that are not written down in the constitution. They just kind of naturally happen because differences happen. Now, um, Washington is overseeing um, the, this growth of political parties um, in his first administration. Uh, after all, he has Thomas Jefferson as the Secretary of State in his cabinet, and he has Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of Treasury in his cabinet. So we have a staunch Federalist and a staunch Democratic Republican. Um, and as he is watching this and trying to maintain this peace, he is noticing a few things that he takes note of in his farewell address. Ta uh, George Washington decides to serve only two terms. Um, and that's because you know it's time to say goodbye. He's setting this precedent of not having a king that's always in power. Um, and he has James Madison and he has uh, um, Alexander Hamilton pin parts of his farewell address. And I have four key quotes here, these kind of warnings. He says, it is of infinite moment that you should properly estimate the immense value of your national union to your collective and individual happiness, right? Basically saying in modern day translation, think about your country first before you think about your individual needs or the needs of a political party. Then he goes on to say, let me now take a more comprehensive view and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party generally which means that political parties can be dangerous, especially if you follow them blindly. You can think about your individual needs, but also the needs of your country. Observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Meaning, don't have these entangling alliances. Like, that's bad news. Uh, because if you have an alliance with England and England goes to war with France, and then all of a sudden you're going to war with France over what, who knows, except the fact you're aligned uh, with England, like, that's going to be really bad news. So try to have good faith with all nations. The nation which indulges toward another a habitual hatred or habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. Which again, goes back to this alliance here. Don't say, oh, well, I'm always going to be friends with France because they helped us in the revolution. And don't say, I'm always going to hate England because we went to war with them, right? Don't get in these habitual habits of peace um, or war. Again, just these translations that I had mentioned, right? Value the country over parts in conflict. Political parties can be dangerous. Avoid entangling alliances. And don't just follow your beliefs blindly, because they might change, especially when it comes to alliances. Now we're jumping forward, like I said, this is going to be a very kind of quick um, review over this longer period of time to talk about how we politically grew to be separate. When John Adams replaces uh, George Washington as president of the United States, John Adams is a staunch Federalist, and we have a Federalist Congress at this time. Now. In addition to this time, we have a war between England and France. And England is trying to drag us into this war, specifically because they're our number one trading partner. And we really want to maintain that trade relationship with them. Now, France is trying to drag us into the war because they helped us out during the Revolutionary War. So, Federals at this time are trying to navigate this balance of peace, right? We are a brand new country. We cannot afford to lose our trading relationship with England, but we also can't alienate our allies like France. So John Adams and the Federalist Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, what do these acts specifically do? Federalists give the government new powers to deport immigrants easier, it makes it harder for immigrants to vote, and it also changes the law on how to become a citizen from 5 to 14 years, basically making it harder for people to vote. Now, he does this in, for a few reasons. One, there's one historical point of view that this occurs specifically to increase the power of the Federalist Party, specifically because a lot of these immigrants that Thomas, uh, sorry, a lot of these immigrants that John Adams and the Federalists are targeting are specifically members of Democratic Republican political party. And so we have an election coming up in the election of 1800, and in order to win, a lot of Federalists say, you know what, let's kind of prohibit freedom of the press, let's, you know, kind of tamp down on freedom of speech. 
and let's change our voting laws and make the punishments really severe and maybe this will allow Federalists to maintain power. Now, of course, Federalists aren't going to say that this is a power grab. Federalists are going to say, we are doing this to ensure peace. There is war between England, there's war between France, and we want to make sure that we stay neutral and avoid war. So you kind of have two different sides here, right? Is this a Federalist power grab or is this just Federalists trying to maintain the peace in a brand new country? What is really important about this is it leads to what's known as the nullification crisis. And the nullification crisis is basically um, states, mainly Democratic Republican states, mainly Southern states that say, we're not following this law. We are nullifying the Alien Sedition Acts, specifically because it's not constitutional. And the person who is leading this nullification crisis is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison write what is respectively known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. And in these resolutions, they say that you know, we express a firm resolution to maintain and defend the Constitution. We love the United States. We love the Constitution. And we have a warm attachment to the union of the states. But alarming infractions of the Constitution in the two late cases of the Alien and Sedition Acts really makes the Southern Democratic Republican states nervous. And because of that, they hereby declare that the aforesaid acts, the Alien and Sedition Acts, are unconstitutional. So again, this is the start of nullification. This concept of the state saying, no, Congress, you are violating the Constitution. This is a right reserved to the state. And because you are infringing upon states' rights, we're not going to follow it. You're later going to see this also with the banking crisis um, in the um, 1820s and 30s. You're also going to see this debate over slavery. If the federal government abolishes slavery, can states then just say, nope, we're not following that law because it's not constitutional? This debate is going to continue. Now, Thomas Jefferson is going to run against John Adams in the election of 1800. And Thomas Jefferson wins, right? Look at this. Look at this chart over here. Thomas Jefferson wins with 53% of the Electoral College. Also, something to note are just these geographic differences here. A lot of Democratic Republicans are located in the South, and a lot of Federalists are located up here in the North or in New England. So this is really important to note because these political differences aren't just debates about the size of the government or power of the government, but they're also geographic differences. And you're going to see this exacerbate as we go into the Civil, as we get closer to the Civil War. Now, super key, at least in my opinion, um, is the Revolution of 1800. This is the first peaceful transfer. I'll move myself right here. This is the first peaceful transfer of power that you are going to see. We have George Washington, who is mainly known as a Federalist, and then John Adams, second president, and he is a Federalist. And now we have the third president, Thomas Jefferson, and he's a Democratic Republican. We have the first peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another, and no one dies. There are no riots in the streets with one side killing the other side. We have, yes, political factions are growing, but nobody dies over this. And this is brand new, basically, in the world. Typically, when you have a change of power from like one monarchical family to another monarchical family or one group of people to another group of people, you're going to have people kill each other in the streets. And this does not happen. And this is wonderful about America. This is our American tradition. This is what other countries need to have that would symbolize strong political stability. John Adams says, I lost. Farewell, goodbye. Thomas Jefferson then walks in to the White House and he resumes power as a Democratic Republican. Now, on this to-do list, because uh, Thomas Jefferson is this 
new party um, representing this new party in Congress, uh, the Democratic Republican sweep Congress. So they're going to make changes. And this is something super common when another political party resumes power. They repeal taxes or they, um, you know, institute new taxes. You know, they have their own political agenda. So Thomas Jefferson focuses on agriculture. He repeals uh, whiskey taxes. He shrinks military spending. He limits the power of the federal government. And you know what? He delivers these notices of these midnight jet. Oh, no, he doesn't. That's right. He does not. Um, we have court packing. Our first kind of case of court packing here. The Federalists lost power in the election of 1800. They lost power in Congress, and they lost power in the executive branch. So there's one more branch left, the judicial branch. And the Federalists try to... In, do they maintain, do they try to maintain power by, with this power grab? A lot of Federalists would say no. They're just having their constitutional duty. Um, however, Democratic Republicans are going to dramatically disagree here. And Democratic Republicans, when Jefferson takes office, is going to say, uh-uh, no. We're not going to pack the courts with all these federal judges. So all of these midnight appointments that were made right before Thomas Jefferson takes office, Thomas Jefferson says no. He instructs his um, Secretary of State, James Madison, says, no, don't deliver the notices to these judges. Do not give them these new judgeships. Now, this upsets this guy right here, William Marbury. So again, historical context, the Federalists lost power in the election of 1800. Congress and Adams passed the Judiciary Act of 1801, which allowed for the immediate appointment of Federalist midnight judges, ensuring that Federalists would maintain power in at least one branch of the government. So this is William Marbury, and he's pretty upset that he did not receive his federal judgeship. So he says, hey dude, um, Thomas Jefferson, can I have my notice? And Thomas Jefferson says, nope, right? He instructs his Secretary of State, James Madison, don't deliver that notice to William Marbury. He's a Federalist. He should not have been appointed. We're not going to have court packing. This is what I'm talking about, right? This is the Democratic Republican saying that the federal government is just trying to reach for power. So now this issue is taken to the Supreme Court. And the question at hand is, should Madison deliver the judgeship to William Marbury? So now we have James Madison, looks incredibly happy in this image. And Madison is arguing, no, I'm not delivering this judgeship. Um, his, he doesn't receive his appointment. This is not okay. The Supreme Court reviews this case, and what they really look at is the federal judgeships that were created in 1801. And the Supreme Court says, so this really isn't personally about Marbury. Instead, the Supreme Court says this is about that Judiciary Act of um, you know, 1801 that was created. Actually, there was a Judiciary Act of 1789, I believe, that was created. And the Supreme Court says, no, like this is not constitutional. But this act in itself was not constitutional. So no, Madison, you don't need to deliver this judgeship, but that's specifically because the act that created this judgeship was unconstitutional. So this is really key here for this second bullet point, right? This sets a precedent, and a precedent is uh, a, 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 something that stands, right? This is the first thing. This is something that stands from here on out. The Supreme Court will check the constitutionality of laws. So we have three branches of government. Legislative makes the laws. Executive enforces the laws. And now the Supreme Court has really defined their role as the judicial branch is what checks the constitutionality of the laws. So they are this final say that says, yeah, constitutional, or nope, not constitutional. And they can define things really narrowly and say, well, only in this case. Or they can say broadly, overall, we cannot have segregation in schools, right? So uh, the Supreme Court essentially gives themselves this power of uh, judicial review. So now we are going to move further into the Jefferson administration with the Louisiana Purchase. So what is this? Merchants and farmers wanted the Mississippi River and the French port of New Orleans for trade. So here is this French port of New Orleans. So all of this white area here, including New Orleans, the French own. 
Now, Jefferson, as this agrarian, really wants to benefit farmers. So if we can buy New Orleans for $10 million, then these farmers along the Mississippi River right here can sell their goods to Latin America, to the Caribbean, and they could use this Gulf of Mexico in order to trade a lot of their goods. Now, as a strict constructionist of the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson is going to cross his T's and dot his I's. He um, asks Congress for this. Congress passes the budget, which okays specifically the purchase of New Orleans for $10 million. And we are all set, all ready to go and buy New Orleans for $10 million. So Thomas Jefferson sends his representative to France and says, okay, let's buy this. It's all done. It's all solid. Con the Constitution allows this all to happen. However, Napoleon's short on cash for a few reasons. We have a rebellion going on in French-controlled Haiti. Napoleon's trying to take over the world, and he needs cash really quickly. So he says, you know what? I will sell that whole territory, not just New Orleans. I'll sell that whole territory that I have for $15 million. So just a $5 million markup. This is a steal of a deal. Now, Thomas Jefferson doesn't quite have enough time to call Congress back in session, to approve the budget, to do all of these things. Remember, at this time, people in Congress are not congressmen. They don't live and breathe, um, you know, in Washington, D.C. or New York or Philadelphia, because right now the Capitol is currently getting built in Washington, D.C. Most of these congressmen live in Virginia or they live in Georgia or they live in Massachusetts and they're farmers slash congressmen, lawyers slash congressmen. So... We make the deal. Jefferson makes the deal, and then retroactively Congress approves it. So now he's not super strict constructionist, but it's kind of like being at the grocery store and you see that chocolate bar, and it's you know Halloween candy, and it's a week after Halloween, and they're giving it away. Like you can't say no to that. I mean, the candy bar is five cents. You gotta buy it. So oh, you know, let me go back, and I'm just gonna show you this map one more time. So you can see. Whoopses. So you can see here that we buy all of that territory, right? Parts of Montana, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, part of Wyoming and Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, um, Iowa, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, part of Louisiana ter Territory, New Orleans. We get a ton of this territory. Later, we're going to get more territory from Mexico and from Great Britain. Um, but we have just grown tremendously at this time with this Louisiana purchase. So after making this Louisiana purchase, this is when Thomas Jefferson um, and Congress create the Corps of Discovery to map up this new land. And this is led by Captain Meriwether Lewis, Lieutenant William Clark, Sacagawea, and her newborn and her husband. And uh, Sacagawea really helps Lewis and Clark navigate the land. Lewis and Clark write, um, along with their you know, Corps of Discovery, because they have a whole bunch of people also traveling with them, um, write journals about the land. They try to map out the land. This is Thomas Jefferson you know, uh, trying on that dress that he bought on sale and he couldn't return and he bought it online. So, ah, let's hope it fits, right? Um, and so we're seeing what we, in fact, bought. And this leads to American expansion, mainly because of Manifest Destiny. Now, Manifest Destiny isn't a term coined for another, like, 40 years after this, but, you know, this concept is still true. It's this idea that now it is our job, it is our God-given duty, in fact, to Christianize and spread over this land. And I'm move myself oh, right there. I'll be the angel. Um, over this land and spread Christianity, capitalism, and progress to the world. So you see Native Americans, and they're in this bottom corner. And they're like, hey, angel of America, yay, thanks for spreading progress. Of of course, that's not exactly what happens here. Um, and you can see American progress is being spread with the good book. So we're bringing the Bible. We're bringing electricity. You can see this um, painting was you know, created a few decades later. Uh, we are bringing canals. We have a transportation revolution that is sparked by this westward expansion with building bigger bridges, canals, building railway, building new roads. Um, and so with this manifest destiny of bringing capitalism and progress and Christianity, 
we are saying we Americans are the true cultivators of the land. We know how to develop. We know how progress works and we are going to be the ones to do it, not the Native Americans. And this of course is going to bring about some additional problems, which we'll talk about later when we get to the Jackson administration. Now with westward expansion, uh, there are some effects. Number one, acquiring new land is going to lead to regional tensions, right? I showed you that election map of 1800, where we have a lot of Federalists located in New England, we have a lot of Democratic Republicans located in the South. This is just going to exacerbate these differences and make them grow even more, specifically because the North is going to be more industrial based. It's going to utilize a lot of the geography up there, a lot of the rivers to build canals, to trade. So as we get more land out west, we're going to build these canals and rivers and roadways first, long before rail, and then navigate those goods to be shipped across the Atlantic to England. And then the southerners are going to grow their agrarian society even more. Plantations are going to grow, slaves are going to be um, naturally procreating, and slavery is going to grow that way because the slave trade is going to be closed. Uh, the transatlantic slave trade is going to be closed. And as these differences expand and the North relies more on industry and the South relies more on slave labor, the big question is going to be, as new states are admitted into this union, are they going to be slave or are they going to be free? That's really the big question mark that um, is brought up with westward expansion. Now, a lot of members of Congress, senators and members of the House, they don't want to tackle this question because they want to get reelected. And so let's just not talk about this. Let's table this discussion. Uh, and they hold off this discussion for as long as they possibly can until 1820. By 1817, Missouri wants to become a state in the Union, and Missouri wants to come become a state as a slave state. Now, again, a lot of members of Congress, specifically Northerners, don't want this to happen for a few reasons. One, it would throw off the balance of power in Congress. Right now, there's 11 free states and 11 slave states, so let's keep it this way. Um, in addition to that, a lot of New Englanders don't want to give up a balance of power because maybe they could get voted out of office, right? Or they could get outvoted when it comes to creating laws. So here we have Henry Clay, who is known as the Great Compromiser, and he brokers this Missouri Compromise. Uh, he also brokered the Compromise of 1850. And his solution is going to say, okay, let's have Missouri enter in the state, enter into the Union as a slave state. And let's create a brand new state, Maine. Let's carve out part of Massachusetts, we'll label that Maine, and now we'll have 12 for 12. So this is an even swap, a slave state for a free state. Now the Missouri Compromise does not does not create a never-ending even swap. This is just a one-time deal. Then from this point forward, all of the states that will be admitted north of the 3630 parallel line will in this new Louisiana territory will be free. And all of the states entered in south of this line will be slave. So we have settled the problem for the future. We are all done. But it's almost like in 1820, we didn't envision going all the way from C to C. Not quite yet. Because if you look at this map here, um, in this blue territory, this is our Louisiana Purchase. So all of the states north of this line, right? It's kind of not the most even line, but you get it. All of these northern states right here in this territory, they will be free states and everything south will be slave. But look at all this territory that we don't have claimed yet. We have California and um, New Mexico and Arizona and Texas. We have all of this territory now that you know we need to decide on. So this kind of puts a band-aid on the situation. But if we look close, 
Again, we're swapping out, and we are making Missouri is going to fly in, and they are going to be a slave state to maintain the balance of power. And then Maine is going to be carved out, and they are going to be a free state. So we have, again, an even one-for-one -one swap. But again, it's a band-aid because we are going to get new territory. We're going to get the Oregon territory. We're going to get Washington. Like I said, we're going to get Arizona and New Mexico and Utah. Um, but... We will have to deal with that later. Now I'm going to close out the lecture right now. And when I pick back up, I'm going to talk about the Indian Removal Act. So thank you so much. I really hope this helped you with your notes. Thanks.